In light of the, the shooting this week that has really rocked our nation yet again, I want to invite you at home and on all our campuses to pray with me for the people of Texas. Holy Father, we, we just don't understand this kind of evil. And if we're honest, we don't understand where you are when this kind of evil takes place. We're not blaming you. But we wonder how you're going to step in and how you're going to intervene. Beyond our questions, we do believe that you can bring triumph out of tragedy and, and beauty out of ashes. We do believe that. But as a nation, we struggle and we, we, we weep, and no more than you, I know, for the 19 children that were killed and the two adults that were senselessly slaughtered. We pray for those victims and their families. We pray for the law enforcement officers and the political leaders who are trying to stop this. And in the middle of all that, Lord, we want to confess to you that we have not been vocal enough about Jesus Christ. And it's partly our silence that has allowed evil to expand in our nation. And so we repent before you today and we pledge to you to name the name of Jesus and live the principles of Jesus so that we can be agents of change right around us. We'll never eradicate evil, but Lord, we wanna minimize the evil in this world by maximizing the voice of Jesus in it. And it's in his name that we pray, amen. Hey, I've been thinking about this in light of this series that we're starting today on the book of Colossians. It may feel like that's a book that's 2,000 years old and maybe irrelevant, but the same struggles that the Colossians were going through, they're, they're on the news every day. And, and the, the biggest part of Colossians is highlighting the person of Jesus. And as we lift Jesus up and give people a clear picture of Jesus, we'll give them a clear path forward in their own lives. We can't eliminate evil, but we can mitigate it and minimize it by, by being what Jesus said we are, the salt of the earth and the light of the world. So with that in mind, we're going to take a look at Colossians for, the, for this entire month. And all we're going to try to do is get a clear picture of who Jesus is. Now, let me just ask you a question. Show of hands on all campuses, even online, you can raise your hand. How many of you wear contacts or eyeglasses? Just show of hands, okay? How many fingers am I holding up? No, just, just kidding. I, until four years ago, I was actually legally blind. And they, they measure eyesight in diopters. So to, to put this in perspective, if you see 2020, this is what you will see. It's pretty clear. But if you're negative, so I was nearsighted, so negative diopters. If you're negative two diopters, this is what you'll see. You can still see it, but it's fuzzy. If you're negative four diopters, this is what you'll see. If you're negative six diopters, this is what you'll see. I was negative nine diopters. Like it was pathetic. My wife bought me this clock for my nightstand. The, the numbers were this tall. I had to be three inches away to actually see it. It was, it was sad. And so I feel sad for you who haven't been healed yet. So four years ago, that was me. But then, and some of you are thinking, was he miraculously healed? No, I wish it would have been cheaper. I had a surgery, not LASIK. I was too bad for LASIK. LASIK reshapes the cornea of your eye so you can see more clearly. It was far more invasive. They cut my eyeballs open and they pulled out the lens and they put in a different lens. I now see 2030. It's, it's, it's amazing. And all for the cost of a used car. <laughs> or at least I should say, for the cost of what a used car used to cost tough times. What, what happened to me in that surgery is what I hope happens with all of us in this series through Colossians, because Colossians is a new lens. It's kind of the opposite. God is going to take the artificial lens through which we see Jesus, the artificial lens of our culture, our expectations, our experiences, and he's going to replace that with the natural lens, the lens of scripture to see Jesus for who he actually is. And can we just admit, we all have an image of Jesus, and though there's much truth in the image we see, there's a lot missing as well. It's fuzzy because we're seeing through the lens of our pain, through the lens of our experience and expectations. We see Jesus as, well, like a wise teacher. He gives us advice for life. Or a good shepherd who leads us to the valley of the shadow of death. 
a compassionate healer who sees us in our pain, or a charismatic leader that he's worth following. But all of these images are kind of a stained glass character of who Jesus actually is. It's not that they're bad images, they're just not comprehensive. They're not, they're not enough. So all that I want to say in this sermon, I, I can put it in a single sentence, you can fall asleep after this. Two, two statements, Jesus is all you need, and Jesus is more than you ever imagined. But we've got to reverse the order because if Jesus is, if you come to Jesus because he's all you need, your needs will be the lens through which you see Jesus. So we say, Jesus, I, I, like, I need you to fix my kid. I got a teenage kid, I'm pretty sure they're demon possessed. I can't prove it, but <laughs> fix it. Jesus, look at my finances. It's like a lot of red ink. I need to get in the black. Just fix it. I, I'm married to this woman and fix her. I mean, clearly you see she's a sinner, but fix her. If your needs are what you give priority to, your needs will define what you see in Jesus. But if Jesus is what you see first, and you see his majesty, his grandeur, his, his, his magnificence, then his image will be the lens through which you see your need, and that changes everything. So we want to switch it around and begin by talking about Jesus is more than you ever imagined. We're going to read a few verses out of Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 15, going to verse 23. You've already heard it read on your campus. I, want to, I just want to walk through it line by line and answer the question, who is Jesus really? You in? Verse 15. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Now, a couple of words there. Firstborn is not talking about the birth of Jesus. Like he has no beginning, he has no end. Firstborn is an image from their world which spoke of the authority that the firstborn son had. He held the keys to the house. He had the authority of the father. He had the nature and the abilities of the father. So when it says Jesus is firstborn, he's talking about the ability, uh, the authority, the power of Jesus that is just like his father's. And that's why Paul uses that word. He's the image of the invisible God. God's invisible, so you can't see him. So how do you know what God looks like? Because of the image. That word was used for coins in the ancient world. Because someone would carve an image of the emperor, and that image then got stamped into metal. It was, it was impressed into metal. And the nature of God is seen in Jesus. Not, you know, brown hair and blue eyes. It's, it's the nature of God is his character. And when you're looking at Jesus, you are seeing the very nature of God. This exact word is used in the exact same way in Hebrews chapter 1. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of the stamp of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. So Paul says that Jesus is the image of God. Hebrews says Jesus is the image of God. And then John, that's Jesus' best friend on earth, uh, he wrote several books of the New Testament. In the Gospel of John, first chapter, he says the same thing. No one has ever seen God. He's invisible. But God, the one and only, has made him known. When you see Jesus, you see God. John says it, Hebrews says it, Paul says it, and so did Jesus. Last night of his life, upper room, his 12 apostles, farewell discourse, Jesus says to the guys, I'm going away. And they were like floored. How, how are we going to get along if you go away? And Jesus says, look, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And one of them, a dude named Philip, goes, uh, excuse me, we, we've never seen God. We've never seen the Father. We don't know what he looks like. We don't know where he is. So how can we know the way? And Jesus, in frustration, says, Philip, I've been with you for three years. And you don't know that when you're looking at me, you're looking at God? But think about that for a minute. What if I said that to you? You're welcome. Like seriously, you, that would be my worst last sermon. Because that's just insane talk. 
But Jesus said it, John said it, Paul said it, Hebrew says it. When you see Jesus, you are seeing the very nature of God. And if Jesus is God, it, like he represents his character, power, authority, then whatever God did, Jesus did too. Well, like what? Well, like verse 16. It says here, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. So whatever is created, he created. We read that same thought, again, Jesus' best friend, John, he opens his book by saying, in the beginning was the word. That's what Jesus was before he was Jesus. He was the word of God. And he was with God in the beginning, and all things that were created, he created, and nothing that has been created was created without him. So, you would expect to find Jesus in Genesis 1, wouldn't you? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Where's Jesus? Verse 3, God said, he spoke, that's a word, he spoke, let there be light. And Jesus, the word of God, made it so. Jesus created light and darkness and heaven and earth and plants and trees and rivers and mountains and oceans and the galaxy. He is the creator of all that is. And not only is he the creator of the world, he is the, right now, in this millisecond, he is the sustainer of all that is. Verse 17, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. What does that mean? In him all things hold together. Let me paint a picture for you. This might surprise you, but I am not actually an expert in quantum physics. I know. But this I know, that an atom has basically three elements, protons, neutrons, and electrons. A proton is positively charged, and neutrons are neutral, and th that makes up the nucleus of an atom. And around the nucleus are all these electrons that spin at unbelievable speed, and there's so much we don't know about atoms, but we, we do know this, that a proton is positively charged, uh, an electron is negatively charged, so it makes sense that electrons would be attracted to the protons because a positive charge and negative charge, well, you played with magnets, right? Boom, they, they, they snap together. But things that are positively charged repel each other. So when you're playing with a magnet and you take the positive side of the magnet and put it next to another positive side of a magnet, what happens? They fly apart because they, they repel each other. So why is it, if you look at this diagram of an atom, why is it that the nucleus stays together? Why don't the protons fly apart? You want to know the answer? Everybody does. Nobody knows. Like, the physicists are going, this doesn't make sense, so there has to be some kind of force pulling them together at the, at the atomic level. And what that force is, they will debate. Different quantum physicists have their own theories, and they don't agree, but all agree on what to call it. You ready? This is what all physicists call it. The strong force. Not very creative. We don't know what it is, but we know it is there even when we can't see it. Now, am I saying that Jesus literally is holding the nucleus of the atoms together? No, I can't say that because I've never been inside an atom. I, I, I don't know. It could be, but this is true about Jesus, that there are, there are things in this universe that you cannot see, and he's holding the spiritual powers and entities together. That's why in verse 18, he says, he is the head, that is Jesus is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. That's the word, supremacy. The church of Jesus Christ is the most global organization there is, and the most diverse organization on the planet from cultures to languages to backgrounds, across time and space and history, across genders and, and political affiliations and philosophies, this, the church of Jesus, there's no reason that it would ever be together at all. But he is the force that pulls us all together. Even at our church, in one city, we have such diversity. 
that is bound together, that you wouldn't find the same diversity anywhere else in our world but in the church. And I know some of you are thinking, yeah, but churches fuss and fight and they divide. And I know, I know. You know where they divide and why they divide? They divide where Jesus doesn't have the supremacy. But I mean, the church is really a phenomenal organization. And even where we're not, where we're divided, it is because we haven't made Jesus the supreme Lord. That's not just true at the macro level, that's true at the micro level of your own family. Where things are flying apart is because we have wanted Jesus to be Savior, but we've not made him Lord. Now, I want to be really clear with this because this is such an important point. Now, I wouldn't say this true about you because you're probably pretty spiritual, but it's definitely true about the person sitting next to you. That there are people who come to the church and they want Jesus to be Savior, but they don't make him Lord. Well, my finances are a mess. Save my finances. But you really haven't made him Lord of your finances. Oh, you'll, you'll give a gift, like an offering. Up, but, <laughs> Jesus, I put a 20 in the plate. Do you see that? Like a month ago, I put in a 50. I was like, really good. But you're not willing to give a tithe. You're not willing to set aside the first 10% of your income because, Jesus, you could be, like, you could be savior of my finances, but not Lord of my pocketbook. Stay, stay out of my back pocket. We, we have relationships that are, that are in triage. And we go, Jesus, I want you to be savior of my relationship, but you're not making him Lord of your sexuality. Like he can be savior in the living room, but stay out of the bedroom, Jesus. That's ours. We, we want him to save our businesses, but we don't want to give him lordship. Like you can be, you can be savior on Sunday, but not Lord Monday through Saturday. Lord, that's, 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 the, the rest of the weekend is ours. You cannot have Jesus as Savior of all unless he is Lord of all. And until Jesus is Lord of all, he probably won't be Lord at all. When we come to Jesus and ask him to save us, it's not like he can be a Savior without being our Lord. I'm still learning. I'm still struggling. Just trust me. I got some closets that are still shut to Jesus. And I'm trying to open them. It's a long process, but I want to. And I remember the very first head-on-head -head collision with Jesus over lordship. I was 16 years old, and I wanted, I wanted to be a brain surgeon. Like that was my occupational drive. And God called me to preach. I'm not, God's not calling everybody to go into ministry, but this is my story. And God came to me and, without words, asked a question, wouldn't you rather heal souls than brains? I said, no. No, because brain surgeons have a higher salary cap than preachers. So, I mean, I want a, a fast car, a, a good job, and a smoking hot wife. So I got one of those three. Wife. And he kept asking me, but wouldn't you rather hear souls than brains? And I, I finally got frustrated. I said, Jesus, I'm 16 years old. I said, Jesus, I've given you 95% of my life. Like, I'm a virgin. I've given you my sexuality. I'm not sleeping around. And I've given you my driving as a 16-year-old. I, I go the speed limit-ish most of the time. I've given, I've given you my, 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 my social calendar. Like, I, I'm honoring you. All I'm asking you is for my vocation. I've given you 95%. And again, without words, the Holy Spirit said, aren't you glad that Jesus didn't give you 95%? Coming to church like once a month, is that really lordship? Or do you just want him to be savior when you're in trouble? Praying at meals, is that really giving him lordship or does he deserve more worship than that? Bringing your kids to church on the weekend and then not having Jesus Lord in your home, is that really gonna rescue them from their teenage years? Until we make him Lord of all, it's doubtful that he will be Lord at all. And even a cursory reading of Colossians. Just, there's this avalanche of honor given to Jesus. He is more than we ever imagined. In verse 13, he is God's son. In verse 14, he is redeemer. He is the image of God in verse 15, as well as the Lord of creation. He's the head of the church who reconciles the entire universe to himself. 
Jesus is the treasure of all wisdom and knowledge, the standard of truth, the fullness of deity in bodily form, the head over every power and authority. He is the fulfillment of the prophecies, promises, sacrifices, and festivals of all the Old Testament. In his death, he conquered the cosmic powers of evil, and in his resurrection, he was enthroned at the right hand of the image of God. This is the cosmic Christ of Colossians. This is the one who deserves to be Lord of your life. And it's all summarized in the smallest sentence, verse 19, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Imagine that. The great cosmic powers of God in an itty-bitty living space. He is in his incarnation. I know this doesn't make sense like from a physics standpoint. How could God be in a bod? But if he wasn't, how would you ever see who God really was? You, you can't see who God is unless he comes in a form that we can understand and relate to and connect with. And that was the purpose of what theologians call the incarnation. And the word that he uses here to dwell, it means to inhabit a house. Like God made Jesus his home. It reminds me of another verse a different words, but in English it's the same word, dwell, but it's a different Greek word. John 1, 14 says, the word, that is Jesus, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. There the word dwell comes from the Greek word for a tabernacle or a tent. Anyone go camping? It's fun for a weekend. If you camp permanently, they call you homeless. Jesus didn't really have a home on earth. He was just wandering for a few years. But when he ascended into heaven, he went back home and God made his home in Jesus. When Jesus was here, he was just camping. In the last three weeks, I've been where Jesus was camping. I stood on the mountain where he gave his most famous sermon. I took a boat ride across the lake where he walked on water and where he calmed the storm. I traversed the Temple Mount where he debated with the religious leaders, where he threw over the tables of the money changers. But the one place that I could not go where Jesus was is his grave. Oh, they have a couple of spots. They say this could be the grave, that could be the grave, but both of them are empty. There is no place where Christians gathered around the tomb of Jesus. Now imagine this, a famous, honored Jew that nobody came to to revere their grave. Why? Because he isn't there. Jesus is more than you ever imagined. And he rose from the grave and is seated right now at the right hand of the Father in heaven, appealing for you as an advocate for you. And because Jesus is more than you imagine, because Jesus is more than you ever imagined, Jesus is all that you need. And our greatest need is spelled out clearly in verse 20, through him to reconcile himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. That's Jesus, all you will ever need. And it's more than you ever imagined because verse 21 says, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he is reconciled. Imagine he's reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. That, that word without blemish, that's the word they use to describe a pure lamb that was fit to be a sacrifice for God. That's how God sees you. He doesn't, he doesn't see your sin. He sees the blood of Jesus. He doesn't see your mess. He sees your potential in Christ. He doesn't see your failure. He sees your future. So that you can be, look at this, free from accusation. What an unbelievable liberation. I would do anything for that kind of peace, including making Jesus Lord of everything. If, he says, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. And I can just sense some saying, well, I suppose that would work for you. 
I'm not sure that would work for me. Read the the last verse. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Paul was a murderer. He had extradition papers from the high priest and he went to a place called Damascus to find Christians, to ferret them out of homes. And he arrested men and women and he put them in prison and he put them to death. That was Paul. But God got a hold of him and he changed Paul's life. He made him from a, from a murderer to a missionary. I don't know what you were, but I know that what you were is not bigger than what Jesus is. And if you can make him Lord of all, he can save you from anything. That's the simple message of the gospel, that Jesus died for your sins. And he rose for your justification so that you could be free from all accusation. I know Paul lived a long time ago, and maybe it's hard for you to relate to him. So I want to present another life story that's closer to home. It's a couple named Don and Anna. They're part of our church, and this is their story. Watch. We were married 12 years before we had kids. We had our second one in 2011, and we were already breaking in 09 before we even found out we were pregnant. We started going to counseling. I never pictured having financial issues. I never pictured um, foreclosing, which turned into bankrupt, foreclosed, divorce, all in the same time period. I just didn't picture that. Your, your typical ugly divorce. We both had lawyers. We fought about everything in court. Uh, eventually got a court order to where we weren't even allowed to communicate. Um, the only communication was through email. So that gives you a picture of how bad the relationship was and how ugly the whole divorce battle was. We just weren't doing anything right. We weren't doing anything God's way. And that was by default because, uh, you know, I grew up as an atheist, grew up in an atheist house. So I was just practicing what I was taught and that was just normal to me. I know that it's better for us all to be together. I know that, but I don't know how that will ever happen. So eventually a a buddy of mine, uh, he invited me to come to church. Going to church obviously can't make things any worse, you know. Um, So I went and that's when I started to dive into the Bible a little bit and start reading that. Um, Then ended up getting hooked up with a Christian counselor, uh, which was just absolutely turning point, just an amazing person that God put in my path. It became the most peaceful time in my life. That's when I let God in 100%. And I remember my friend telling me, if he has this heart change, you will know. It will be evident that he has a heart change. And I feel like it must have been Halloween-ish where I was like, huh, I think something's different. (laughs) And that was the first night we really talked in years. Um, So we'd both been going to church, reading the Bible, going to counseling, working on getting ourselves healthy. So that was the first time that I could really see a God's work bringing us two together. And now uh, we have two healthy people with God in their life to where before we were two unhealthy people without God in our life. I remember thinking I'm either the dumbest person on the planet (laughs) dating him again (laughs) or this has to work because if God's first if we keep God first always how could it not work we can make it through anything if God is here he makes it possible Um, so now we've been married for seven years Uh, the first round was 14 then a two-year intermission and now uh, seven years and really, it, there, there's no answer of what we did to get where we are. The only thing was God did it all. 
He orchestrated the counselor in our life, all the different accountability people to get us where we're at because there's there's just no way we could have did it. I, I got to live a miracle. God got to take us from people that were <laughs> very separate, separate enough and toxic enough together to get divorced and then to bring us back together. I mean, that that's a miracle to me. I mean, and it wasn't nothing that we did to earn it or nothing we could have done. It was accepting God and he takes care of the rest for it. That song right now, this is a house of miracles. This house. God did it. This is a house of This is a house of miracles because the Lord of this house is the image of the invisible God. And the Lord of this house is the creator God. 
The Lord of this house is the sustainer God. He's not just more than you ever imagined, but because he is more than you ever imagined, he is all that you'll ever need. And if you will make him Lord of all, he could be savior of anything. I hope you believe that for yourself today. It's not dependent on you or your goodness, your, your faith or your, it's your allegiance that matters. Will you pledge allegiance to the one Lord and King, Jesus Christ? If you do that, you'll see him with a new clarity and you'll see your own needs with a new clarity. The stakes are higher than you think. Because this isn't just about your finances or your family or, or your well-being. God intends to bring healing to your house so that that healing can spill over to those around you. We'll, we'll never eradicate all the Uvaldis, but we can minimize them and we can mitigate them. And we can even enter into the midst of them and be the salt and light of this world. We're not, a, we're not a church that just brings people together for their own healing. We're a church that wants to bring healing to our city. That's why we're planting campuses all over, and that's why we're, we're encouraging you to take your next steps in faith. That's why we present Jesus as not just Savior, but as Lord. Let's make him Lord so that he will hold sway over the city we inhabit and the people that we love. Holy Father, would you move all of us to open every last corner and closet of our lives so that you will be Lord of all, so that we could bring hope to all who are around us. Through your Holy Spirit, would you reveal to us that area that we've not given sway to you and we would relent and we would repent and we would make you Lord of every last segment of our lives not just for your glory but for the good of our community we pray this in Jesus name amen let's go make Jesus famous